Anybody who knows anything about history knows that true crime is often far worse than fiction, and when reading a particularly gruesome news story, I often find myself hoping against hope that it turns out just a bad dream, fake, a misunderstanding, fiction, anything but real. In 2000, in the city of Rizan, one of Russia's oldest cities, two underage girls went missing as they were going home from a nightclub. It was a holiday and the streets were filled with people. 14-year-old Katya and 17-year-old Lena had gotten into a car with two strange men offering them a lift, and then they just disappeared. Four years later, another young girl walked into a police station bearing a terrible note that astounded the officers on duty. If you watched my video on John Jamelski, you might think it couldn't get any worse than that. It can. As I was putting together this material, I found myself having flashbacks. For those who still haven't seen it, I'll leave a link in the description. Check it out and consider subscribing to my channel so you don't miss new videos. Razan is an ancient regional center, much older than Moscow. In 1237, the city was conquered and destroyed by the hordes of Batu Han. The Mongols were raiding many Russian cities at the time, and one of the fiercest attacks was on Razan, which was completely razed. Now the centerpiece of downtown Razan is the old Razan Kremlin, which protected the city throughout the Middle Ages. Only 200 kilometers from Moscow, Razan is the capital of Razan Oblast, a region rich in forests and nature reserves. A vast plain stretches hundreds of kilometers. Tourists flock to the city's many museums. It was in this city that on September 30, 2000, Lena Samohina, who studied at a vocational school, and Katya Martinova, an elementary school student, were returning from the Faith, Hope and Love Orthodox Christian holiday celebration. They went to a nightclub, and despite the fact that Lena was 17 and Katya was only 14, they managed to obtain alcohol and cigarettes. The girls were standing at the bus stop, getting ready to go home, smoking and laughing. Nothing foreshadowed trouble, just two teenagers having fun after a night out. Two men in a beige Russian-made car pulled up next to them. One of them, who looked to be younger, introduced himself as Alexei and offered the girls a lift home. Not wanting to wait for the bus that chilly September evening, they agreed. Once in the car, Alexei offered them a drink, and Katya and Lena, in their teenage naivete, unsuspectingly took a sip and passed out. The girls woke up as the car pulled up to a house in a village. They were clearly not in Rizan and not at home but somewhere on the distant outskirts of the city. Still feeling the effects of the drug that had been in the drink, Katya and Lena started begging to be taken home. The driver, who hadn't said a word before that, now demanded that the girls undress. He considered them prostitutes and was waiting for sex. The girls, of course, refused, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. By his logic, by getting into his car, they agreed to have sex. Then, Alexei got back into the car only now it became clear that he was actually a woman, 25-year-old Yelena Badukina. She threatened to sick dogs on the girls if they didn't obey the driver. In the end, Katya and Lena did everything he demanded. What happened after that is like something out of a horror movie, but unfortunately, it was very real for Katya and Lena. There was a six meter deep basement under the men's garage. It had taken him several years working summer and winter to build a working bunker with several doors and ventilation system. He carried Katya there, unconscious, and Lena walked herself. As soon as the older girl was downstairs, he slammed the heavy hatch, closed the doors, and locked the girls underground. Then he disappeared for several days seemingly thinking about what to do with his victims. After that, he would descend to them almost every day and take advantage of their helplessness. He did whatever he wanted to them, threatening them with starvation and blocking the ventilation. Katya and Lena desperately tried to escape. 
Katya was still a child. She had just started puberty and barely understood what was happening. Lena, realizing the pain her friend was in, tried to satisfy the rapist herself so that he would lay off the younger girl. However, one girl was not enough for him. He would rape them in turn, sometimes several times a day. This continued day after day, month after month, and sadly, year after year. The girl spent almost four years in captivity, or 1,312 days. Katya and Lena tried every way they could to stay sane. Katya wrote and drew, and Lena studied English in the textbooks left by the rapist. And then Lena became pregnant, a fate Katya was spared due to her young age. When he learned about the pregnancy, the rapist gave Katya a textbook on obstetrics, which she was to read to figure out how to help Lena give birth. The only thing she really learned from the book was that she would have to cut the umbilical cord, which she would do with blunt scissors, sterilized in vodka. It was a boy named Vladislav, whom the rapist immediately whisked off. Naturally, the girls had no idea where he went. After a while, she became pregnant again, and she was forced to give birth to another son in a dungeon. Katya again had to work as a midwife, filling the basin with water. This boy was named Alak, and realizing that the maniac would probably take him again, the girls wrote a note and placed it in a secret pocket on the baby's vest. Perhaps someone from the outside world, upon taking the child in their arms, would see the plea for help. They wrote that they had been in captivity for several years, but the rapist found it when he was dressing little Alak and destroyed it. The girls waited for help in the dungeon, but after a while they lost hope, realizing that no one had found their appeal. The maniac left the boy into the entrance of an apartment building in Rizan, where he was found by a kind woman. Nothing is known about his fate, but the criminal tried to cover his tracks as carefully as possible. He left a note in which he made a spelling error writing a lack four months, so that anyone who found him would think that a very young uneducated had given birth to him. Time passed. In her prison, Katya wrote poems, which she most often dedicated to her mother. Mama, get me out of here. Mama, this powerlessness is unbearable. Mama, my disillusionment in people grows in this land of violence. Mama, my heart is no longer alive, but my hand finds the pulse. Mama, tell me what's wrong. For 17 months, nothing has made any sense. Mama, I'm afraid of losing my mind, walking in circles in these four walls, eyelashes bearing a heavy load, drops falling down to my lips. Mama, cry out until you lose your voice. Before me, an unbearable separation. I haven't seen a star for almost two years. I hear no familiar sounds. Mama, I'm so lonely today, empty to the fullest depths. Mama, the roads that separate us spread out in a long ribbon. The old devil doesn't scare me, but he locked the door to freedom. Mama, it doesn't open with a key. Mama, it's so cold underground. Never seeing her mother again was the worst thing she could imagine. It was her desire to return home that made her live on, think about the future, about life above ground. She always believed that someday she would get out. She had given birth to children she had not wanted, and then they were taken away from her. It's hard to even imagine how she coped with hormonal changes after childbirth and with consequences of giving birth without any doctors. Nevertheless, the girls tried to make the best of their situation. In the meantime, their rapist bought them food and clothes, and he even bought Katya paint when she asked for it. His sick heart had a strange disposition for her. At some point, he seemed to have fallen for her so much that he allowed her to wash in his bathroom in the house, and occasionally took her outside for some fresh air. Once she tried to escape, running out of the house, but he caught up with her and carried her back, beating her. Beatings were a regular occurrence, and sometimes he even sprayed tear gas in the room. When the girls didn't resist and would do as he asked, he would give them chocolates and presents. 
but sometimes he tormented them, for example withholding underwear from Lena when her period began. They were left to figure out how to manage their daily necessities themselves, like using a bucket left in the corner as a toilet and a basin of water was a sink. It's very reminiscent of the Jamalski case, only far worse. The rapist and his prisoners celebrated their birthdays, New Year, and International Women's Day together in a bunker. The girls would cook and their tormentor kept them company. But they were holidays only for the sadists, because Katya and Lena were given no reprieve to his violence. One day he brought them magazines from his home to keep them occupied, and one of the magazines had been sent to a certain Viktor Mohov in the city of Skopin. Now the terrible face that had caused them so much pain finally had a name. Katya and Lena, deciding to scare Mohov, told him that they knew his name. This, however, was a mistake. He had been thinking about letting them go because he didn't know what to do with them next. But now that they knew his name, they could go to the police and he would be arrested. But the girls did not give up. They were dead set on escaping and waited for an opportunity. Once Mohav came down to the basement with a rope and Katya understood what it was for, she began to pray that he would not kill them as she got down on her knees. He was now stuck between a rock and a hard place. He didn't have the courage to kill them, but he could no longer release them. In those few months, he often mulled over filling the entire basement with concrete and keeping the captives forever with him. By 2003, it seemed to Mohav that his captives had lost all will to resist, and he started taking them out for walks, one at a time. He came up with the idea of making Katya his new accomplice. The rapist told the girls that he wanted to bring another girl to the basement. Two were not enough. The girls realized that this could be bad news. Maybe he got tired of them and was going to replace them. They would have to run and do it as quickly as possible. Mohav's choice was a girl named Alona, a tenant that rented a room in his house and a student at the Skopin Medical School. He started visiting her often and he would take Katya with him, introducing her as his niece. Alona didn't really like to be visited by strangers, and she tried to limit their visits as best as she could, but Mohav was stubborn. Sometimes he brought ice cream and alcohol, and Katya would later say that drugs were often mixed in with them. Mohav wanted his tenant to pass out, but the girl fortunately didn't drink or eat anything, largely thanks to Katya, who tried her best to make sure that she didn't take anything from his hands. Alona was the girl's only hope. She had assumed she might figure it out by herself just by being around Mohav and the girls who reeked of a moldy basement from a mile away, but she didn't catch on. Then Lena wrote a note, which Katya hid in her hair under a hairpin. Sweetheart, we don't know your name, but we hope you can help us. You're our only chance for salvation. We know you're renting a room in the house of a man named Victor, but you have no idea what kind of a person he really is. For four years now, he has been keeping us in a basement under his barn, which is located in his garden. The entrance is hidden. The police are looking for us, but they can't find us. We ask you only one thing. Take this note to the police station and give them the address of the house where you are now living. All the years that we have spent here, we have not seen anyone except Victor. He keeps us here, torments us, rapes us, sometimes he beats us. We know that he seems like a normal person, but he's not. I, Yelena, had two children from him, whom he took from me and left them somewhere. Maybe you have heard news about them being found. Now I am pregnant again, somewhere around five months. We really want to go home to our families, and only you can help us. We are sure that you won't be indifferent. We only beg you, don't show this note to Victor. Don't give any sign that you saw it. He faces a long prison term, and he'll kill both you and us, so that doesn't happen. Be careful. Thanks in advance. God help you. Lena and Katya 
When Mahak brought Katya to visit Alona again, she pretended to be very interested in the music that Alona was listening to, and she let her hair down and removed the note. She put it in one of the empty cassette holders, figuring that it was probably this cassette that was now in the player, and at some point the girl would put the cassette back and find the plea for help. Her plan worked. When Mahav and his niece left, Alona found the note, packed her things, went to her hometown and contacted the police. The police arrived a few days later. The girls heard unusual sounds above them. It was clearly not Mahav walking around. All this time, Katya and Lena had jumped at every sound, afraid that Mahav had learned about the note and would flood the basement to get rid of any evidence. The police tried to force him to confess, first accusing him of stealing spare parts at the car factory where he worked. When they took him to the station, they said that they would dig under his garage. Mohav realized that if they dug, the girls would die crushed under the earth and he would be accused of murder. In the end, the maniac confessed and told them that he was holding Katya and Lena. The girls were released on May 4, 2004. Lena was in her fifth month of pregnancy, her third child from the rapist. When the police entered the garage, they couldn't believe their eyes. The entrance was so well camouflaged that even standing above it, they couldn't tell that there was a room holding two girls under them at that very second. A small staircase led down resting against a metal cover. Behind it was a safe door that had to be opened in order to get to the captives. Strangely enough, the release of Katya and Lena took six whole hours. The girls knew that they were about to be rescued, but they were constantly asked to wait. When asked when they could finally come out, the cops yelled down quiet and talked about taking pictures of the crime scene. They ended up keeping the girls downstairs several more hours than necessary to preserve evidence. The Russian police are known for being humane to crime victims. We stopped worrying a long time ago. How long you been here? Since September 30th, 2000. So you spent here four years? Four years. Can you imagine? There's water on the walls and no way to get out of here. It's embarrassing the way we ended up here. But at least now the maniac was arrested. Who was he and how did he get the idea to kidnap two young girls? Mahav was born in 1950 in Skopin. His father was a laborer and his mother a secretary. She had been a domineering control freak. His parents separated in 1972 and Mahav has a sister seven years younger than him. After school, Mahav decided to stay in Skopin and got a job as a mechanic at the Skopin Auto Parts factory where he was one of the best workers and won many awards. His neighbors spoke well of him. He was quiet, calm and hardworking. When he started building his underground bunker, to their surprise, he worked even in the winter, despite the severe cold, and his neighbor's wives told their husbands they should be more like him. Mahav hadn't gotten along with girls since he was very young. He had always been into the most beautiful, brightness and most interesting, but they didn't see anything in him. In the late 70s, he got married, but they divorced after three months. They didn't get along. His mother always asked him why he couldn't find a soulmate, but he only shrugged. He lived in her house, working at the factory without attracting any attention. His friends tried introducing him to girls, but none of them clicked. His first and only, before the attacks, was his wife, at 29 years old. Mohav had actually kidnapped his first victim back in 1999, but nobody had learned of it until later. He invited a 13-year-old girl and her friend to visit him and after getting them drunk began molesting her. She tried to fight back and ran away, so Mohav caught up with her on the street, hit her over the head and dragged her into his basement. He held her in his bunker for two weeks, raping her, and then he released her. She didn't go to the police, apparently feeling guilty and fearing the humiliating stigma as a rape victim and public judgment as unfortunately happens with many victims of sexual violence. Escaping unscathed, Mahav was emboldened to try his luck again. Once he was caught though, what do you think his punishment was? In the end, he had raped each girl almost a thousand times. 
After his bunker was discovered in 2005, Mahov was sentenced to 17 years in prison. He faced several charges, kidnapping, sexual assault of a minor, beatings, and kidnapping of a child. Mahov's accomplice, who had introduced herself to the girls as Alexei but was actually Yelena Badukina, received five and a half years in prison. A minor punishment for two broken lives and a stolen childhood. In fact, Mahov kidnapped her sons as well and then dumped them without her knowing. But that's not the end of it. In 2021, having served his sentence, Mahov was released from prison and returned to his native Skopin. What's scary is that he is in good health and physically fit, and there is nothing preventing him from repeating his old ways. He's had enough time to plan new attacks, so what's stopping him? After his release, Mahov, dubbed by the media as the Skopin Maniac, became a celebrity. He gave interviews, talked about himself and his captives. The most famous being his interview with a controversial journalist and even more controversial politician named Ksenia Sovchuk who provided a huge platform with millions of views on her YouTube channel, giving him free reign to talk about his life and crimes. The public was outraged. She had made a star out of a maniac. Nevertheless, it gave us the opportunity to see inside the mind of a monster. Mahov, in his own words, did not have time to engage in naval gazing during his prison term, indicating a complete lack of remorse for his crimes. In his interview with Sobchak, he put it like this. I have only good character traits. I don't have any bad traits. I may have stumbled a little, but who doesn't? It's almost as if he's quoting Jamelski. He loves media attention, saying it gets him high. As for the girls Mo have held for four years in the basement, he seems to still consider them his property. First, he believes that since Lena and Katya agreed to get into his car and consume alcohol, they are easy. Even though Katya had been only 14 years old, it irked him that Lena, after leaving prison, didn't have more children. He actually said that he would need to take care of her again because she had had his children. That's pretty much an open admission that he was prepared to rape again. This is a common refrain for many murderers and rapists. They consider their victims their property, even after they escape. Mahav knew perfectly well that Katya would never reciprocate, would never love him the way he loves her, but he kept the girls in the bunker in the hopes that someday they would share his feelings. In his mind, there is no difference between sexual relations and love, and attention he paid to girls was more like sadistic relationships with misbehaving children. If you're good, I'll buy you candy bars and finger paints. If not, I'll beat you. Fortunately, Mahav wasn't the only one talking to journalists. Katya Martinova also talks about what happened to her and even wrote a book about her experience. Writing helped her cope with the memories of the bunker. Thanks to her, we know all the most terrible details and she talks about them regularly in interview after interview. What's worrying is that for some reason, her stories are less popular than interviews with Mahav himself. After Mahav was released, Katya of course fears that he will find her again especially when she heard that he still has feelings for her. During his imprisonment, he somehow found her address and wrote her a threatening letter claiming that after he is released, he'll tell the whole world that Katya and Lena are not as innocent as everyone thinks. Here's what Katya Martinova had to say about his release. Until the 3rd of March, I couldn't believe that he got out. It was like a bad dream. And now he's somewhere nearby. Maybe in Moscow, walking the streets, living somewhere close by. I know he wants to see me. Maybe to apologize or say something. Or maybe he'll be angry with me that I got away. I'm expecting it. Maybe in the near future something will happen. He'll go somewhere. I'm scared. And not even because he'll kill me, but because I'll have to see him again. I don't want to see him, but he might appear. However, this wasn't the end of terror at the house of the Scopian Maniac, as recent as in August 2022, an actual murder took place there. It was the public holiday celebrating the Russian airborne forces, and as Mahav sat down to commemorate with his friends, he accused one of them of stealing a goose. An argument broke out, and one of the maniac's guests killed the alleged foul thief with a blow to the neck. Investigators believe that Mahav then helped hide the body, 
It was found a few days later, and Mahov's acquaintance confessed to the murderer. Now, the state is deciding whether to open a criminal case against him for concealing a felony. Mahov now lives in Skopin, in the same house where he built his bunker. It is filled with water now, but it remains there. After his interview with Ksenia Sapchuk and several more public addresses, he was finally forbidden to talk to journalists and was put under watch. He is banned from attending public events where they serve alcohol for six years. Other than that, he can do whatever he wants. According to his neighbors, he has recently even begun repairing that hellish garage again. Katya and Lena no longer talk. Lena wants to forget about the experience and Katya is a reminder of it all. Katya put it this way. Before it all, I was kind of shy, soft, spineless. My mother said that I was weak. When I ended up here, I still don't understand what happened, but I really wanted to live. I knew that there was life above. Why was it being taken away from me? Why did I have to follow someone's orders? At some point, everything turned upside down on me. The bunker made me the way I came out, strong and tough. Lena became an English teacher and Katya married several times and had two kids, wrote a book and runs a fund to help victims of sexual violence. Lena doesn't give interviews and leads a rather closed life. The sons born in the bunker have been raised in new families. After she was released, Lena could not take them. Their new families carefully keep their origins a secret. The child Lena was pregnant with at the time of release did not survive. Katya is trying to do everything she can so that no one ever forgets about the atrocities of the Scopian maniac. He may seem like a decrepit old man today, but he's still just as dangerous. Could he be waiting for the right time to find a new victim? His 17 years in prison have not changed him one bit. 17 years is not nearly enough to pay for everything that those two girls went through in that god-awful moldy basement. Only 17 years for a psychopathic rapist. And he still lives comfortably in that very same house where he committed unspeakable acts of terror against innocent victims for so many years. I'm all out of words. If you have something to add, let me know in the comments. In the meantime, as always, stay safe.